How many times this week have you sat in an unproductive meeting? Or have you thought of a brilliant business idea while you were in the shower, but don't have time to pursue it? Maybe you're sitting in your seat right now, browsing through these TEDx talks and feeling motivated to do something better in the world. I have, and that's why I love going to hackathons. In a short amount of time, sometimes even just 24 hours, groups of people come together to look beyond these boundaries and get things done. They make messy business proposals and product ideas, and they present them. Now, you might think that hacking is all about breaking into a computer system, but it's much more than that. Hacking now refers to any activity where someone is modifying a system so that it does something other than what it was originally built to do. Even though hacking can be very empowering, I'm here today to tell you about how we can improve the way we hack by focusing on solutions rather than, I mean, sorry, focusing on problems rather than starting with solutions. Hackathons are not new, and they are growing around the world. A hackathon is an event where people come together, they spend short bursts of time pitching ideas and making technology and business solutions. They can be intense and technical, or they can just be downright silly. I am particularly interested in civic hackathons, which are focused on building solutions that address larger societal issues. Last June, the organization Code for America came up with a national day of civic hacking that connected dozens of groups around the country. Among these groups are five fish hackathons that tried to help small-scale fish farmers improve their practices. What I find interesting about these groups is that they are asked to solve highly complex problems in a short amount of time with little support. The idea is that if you put talented people in the same room, something great will come out of it. You can think of hackathons as a rebellion against slow analytical decision making. And they can be extremely productive if you count the number of solutions that they generate. For example, in 2014, the UK government held a three-day hackathon called NSVC Hack to combat sexual violence. Together, the teams came up with more than 200 ideas. Even though hackathons are widely accepted as a tool for innovation, I don't think we talk enough about the impact that they bring. And that might be because some 90% of projects started at hackathons do not continue beyond the weekend. Imagine how many more useful solutions would exist if just 10% of these projects lived on. Now, Hackathon projects are a lot like startup businesses. And the number one reason startups fail is because they built something that nobody needs. So before we all go out and start proposing hacking and hackathons at the workplace, I think we need to realize that focusing on building solutions isn't going to create innovation. What if, instead of starting with solutions, we hacked problems? So for the past two months, I have been studying the hackathon culture in downtown Chicago. Chai Hack Night is a weekly event where programmers, data scientists, designers, and even students work on tech projects around civic issues. For example, there is a group called Ride With Me that's developing an app to help you get to learning opportunities around the city safely. Now, most hackathons aren't like this. They tend to happen over one weekend. But all hackathons start with a grand promise that we can change the world or build a best-selling product. And the hacking begins when people gather the courage to pitch their ideas, things like a social network for students or an app for pizza delivery. If you gather enough people for your group, you'll spend the rest of your day making a prototype of your solution. The event wraps up with presentations and sometimes prizes. Because the focus is to deliver, it is easy to get so caught up in building a solution that we forget about the impact it will bring. By starting with solutions, we assume we know the people we're trying to help and what they need. I am part of a group right now called Access to Justice. And we spend every Tuesday night trying to figure out how we can help people who have just been released from prison re-enter society. 
Now, a few months ago, this problem wasn't even on my radar. I was shocked to learn that one in two people who have just left prison will return within three years. At our first meeting, we were convinced that we needed a way to help parolees re-enter society by avoiding technical violations, such as missing a court hearing or forgetting to check in with the parole officer. Then we thought the solution could be as simple as building an app that could warn people not to do these bad things. Then we wanted to get county prisons to release their data so that we could say exactly how many people were being put back for these violations. Over the course of a month, we learned that we were looking at the problem all wrong. We invited a journalist to talk to us, and we found out that getting government agencies to release their data is a time-consuming process that can take upwards of eight months. We found out that parolees have other things to worry about. When they've just been released from prison, many don't even have a place to stay. With a criminal record, it's difficult for many of them to find jobs. Older individuals don't even know how to use email, let alone a smartphone. We learned about reentry circles, small support groups that help these people get their lives back on track. But it's difficult to find any good information about these circles anywhere. One time, one of our group members was curious about the kinds of resources that a person who has just left prison would get. And so she decided to call the local community hotline. The answer? just a single phone number to an employment agency that isn't even open outside of business hours. Either one of these problems presents an open opportunity for a solution, but we wouldn't have arrived at any of these if we hadn't challenged ourselves to learn about our users. I mean, yes, we could have made an app that beeps every time a court hearing is coming up, but we are going to have a greater impact if we just promote reentry circles or updated reentry information on hotlines. In other words, spending time to learn about our users has saved us time in the long run. Starting with solutions also prevents us from thinking creatively, seeing things not as they are, but as what they could be. Creativity comes from making analogies. I'm sure we've all tried some of these hacks in our lives before, such as using a piece of cardboard to prop a desk or a rubber band to open a tight jar. If we see cardboard merely as a box to store things, we forget that it's also a sturdy material that can hold up a desk. In order to come up with creative ideas, we need to break a problem down into its essence and connect it to other concepts and ideas. Some psychologists measure creativity using this principle in what is known as the remote associates test. In this test, you would see three words. And the goal is to come up with another word that is somehow related to these words. In this example, the answer would be apple. All right, let's put this to the test. Imagine you have all signed up for a hackathon, and it's happening right now. Here is your problem. More than 1.2 billion people around the world do not have dependable access to electricity. They end up using dangerous forms of energy, such as diesel generators and kerosene lamps. How would you solve this problem? How would you create a source of reliable energy for people who don't have one? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. All right, time's up. Did you think of building a solar power generator in these communities? What about a wind power generator? That would be kind of expensive though, wouldn't it? Let's think for a second about what electricity is in the first place. Energy. There are all kinds of ways to generate energy. What about movement? Could we generate enough energy from our movements to create reliable electricity. And this was roughly the train of thought that Jessica Matthews and Julia Silverman had when they were challenged to solve this problem in an engineering class at Harvard. 
Having traveled through Africa, they also recalled how some of the children in some of these communities loved playing sports and would even make soccer balls out of old rags. With these two ideas connected, they decided to make a soccer ball that could absorb kinetic energy as it was being kicked around. Their solution, the socket ball, has since attracted wide media attention and hundreds of thousands of dollars in funding. Matthews was even appointed the ambassador of entrepreneurship by the president of Nigeria. Even though this wasn't started as a, at a hackathon, it's a good example of how breaking problems down into their essence helps us come up with better ideas. Now, even though doing this is important to come up with meaningful solutions, this is much easier said than done. Last year, I was part of a hackathon for wildlife, and I proposed an app that could help families conserve wildlife in the city. I still remember the first thing my teammate said to me as I sat down. All right, guys, we don't have time to do the research, so where do we start? In order to get people to look at problems, you first need to convince the team that there are other ways of seeing the problem. You could try a technique called force connection. It comes from creativity expert Michael Michalko. And the idea behind force connection is to think of a distant concept. The more random, the better. I tried this with the design team I was working with last year. And our goal was to build a website that could help people make better graphic designs. I asked each person on the team to think of a random object in the room and connect it to our challenge. I decided to choose a mop. So in my head, I imagined the fluid fibers of the mop and how it can make things look new again. This inspired me to think of our website as something flexible and fluid. And one of the ideas I came up with was to let people try on designs before committing to them. I know it seems a little silly, but the point is to remind ourselves that there are other ways of seeing the problem. Another technique you could try to get people to look at problems is to involve everyone in the research. Assign responsibilities so that each person is looking at something different. One week at Chai Hack Night, we decided to evaluate a, an online guide for reentry. And we asked each person on the team to look at different chapters of the guide. In just one hour, we were able to identify major problems with the guide in less time than either one of us could have done alone. Research can be even simpler than this. Last year, I was working with a design team, and I asked my teammates to go into the office, find another person, and watch them use our website for just 10 minutes. When we met again, everyone was excited to tell the group what they learned. And it was so much easier to fix problems with the website. One of the greatest innovators of our time, Albert Einstein, often talked about how he would spend more time defining a problem rather than solving it. And there are so many ways that hackathons can empower people to tackle big problems. But I believe we can have a greater impact if we just spent more time looking at problems. So the next time you're in a meeting and somebody says, here's the solution, tell them this. If we want to put our talents to good use, we need to spend time learning about the people we're trying to help. We need the space to see how our problems are related to other problems. M most challenging of all, we need to convince ourselves that we might be wrong. Take time to explore the problem, and you can revolutionize the way you problem solve. Thank you.